Most people listening to this talk on a computer or smartphone will agree that designers and engineers have an outsized impact on our daily lives. And it's not just your digital devices. The products we buy, the services we use, the things we eat, how they get to us and how we dispose of them, these are all shaped by innovation in engineering and design. As someone who combines design and engineering and who teaches others how to do the same, I'm especially concerned about understanding the impact we have on human lives and society. Since I believe that our greatest existential risk is climate change, I believe this impact needs to be sustainable. I also believe we should be designing technologies in ways that support psychological well-being. Doing so is a matter of professional ethics. What is ethical engineering? Well, the answer to this question has changed over time. As you might imagine, it has been influenced by changing values. For example, in the 18th and 19th centuries, engineers drove the first industrial revolution. This included exciting new materials, brand new forms of energy, and new technologies to increase productivity. These were the factories, steam engines, and trains, rushing industry and people's lives into new frontiers. England was at the heart of this industrial revolution, taking the reins with deep Victorian values. At the cusp of this revolution, Prince Albert organized the Great Exhibition of 1851. A crystal palace, an engineer wonder constructed entirely of glass and iron that rose from the ground as if by industrial magic. Visitors came from all over the world, including Charles Dickens, Lewis Carroll, Charles Darwin, to experience the industrial miracle. It was such a success that its revenues funded Albertopolis. Today, Albertopolis is known as Exhibition Road, pictured here in modern-day London. The vision for Albertopolis was to celebrate and drive the advancement of industry in the UK. Today, it is the home of Imperial College London, the Royal College of Arts, and the Victorian Albert Museum world-leading institutions in design and engineering. But there's more to this story. If we take a closer look, we find there are also impacts on humans and society that aren't quite so worthy of celebration. There are children working in these factories. Workers are exploited, living crowded and sanitary conditions and disease is rampant. The air fills with smoke and the water with waste. Here in London in 1858, we see death himself rowing through a toxic river Thames. What values were driving a technological progress that could overlook such massive costs? And could things have been done differently? During this industrial revolution, our values were centered on improving the economy, expanding commerce and building empire. This meant productivity and speed were the heroes of the day. Engineers were expected to target this. The steam engines, electricity, trains, planes and cars that we created required that we take natural resources from the land including water and air, and use them to feed into the economy. In addition to the consumption of resources, our products also produce waste when we make them, use them, and dispose of them. Although the impacts on humans and the environment were already evident in the 19th century, it took decades, decades, before changes were made. One way to address this is to minimize the flow of resources from and to the natural environment. This is what we call the circular economy. Waste gets fed back into industry. 
This is a change in thinking from a framework in which we rely on infinite depletion and pollution of what are actually finite resources to a new framework where the ideal innovation creates no waste it can't reuse. This reflects a change in values. Today, environmental impact assessments and sustainable engineering practices are changing every industry. In fact, environmental sustainability is a requirement for every industry. But as we improve technologies so they support our natural environment, what else has happened? Big data, small data, the data about our lives and our behaviors is so lucrative that is now often called the new oil. This makes companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon the new oil companies. But there's a significant change in the way we envision society, technology, and the economy. For many of today's technologies, satisfying a human need is not the end goal, but only a means to an end. Facebook doesn't provide free social networking services to help the world connect. It does so to make a revenue. Meeting a human need for connectivity is only valuable in so far as it produces profit. And that profit comes from the data it generates and the attention it extracts and sells to advertisers. From a business perspective, Facebook's goal is to keep you paying, paying attention and sharing data. Even those tools designed for work, like email, produce human impacts that can be overlooked in the race for commercial gain. And we have seen what happens when we do not consider the impact of resource depletion and discarding waste. When humans are used as a resource, the impacts can be felt by each of us every day. We deplete humans of attention to engage with others, to enjoy nature, to exercise, or do the things that in the longer term matter to them. The activities that support long-term well-being. Of course, there are differences between design and policy that supports a sustainable environment and one that supports the respect for human nature. Environmental sustainability deals with products like factories and bridges that are slow or static once installed. They have smaller scale impact and are localized to the place where they are built. The impact can be anticipated. <clears throat> And there's a long history of measuring this impact. But mainly, nature is the resource. On the other hand, measuring the impact of technology when it uses humans as a resource is very different. The technologies are intelligent. They self-learn and are fast changer. They're unbounded. Something produced in London can change the life of people in Argentina. They require continuous monitoring. Measuring the impact is, is a new thing. AI studies, AI ethics studies are now all the rage. And again, the most important change is that humans are the resource. We are means to an end, not the end in itself. Technology innovation is influenced by the social values of the time. And today, we are at a crossroads. Do we move forward towards a world where we fully recognize the impact of technology and demand that it follows our values? Or do we give up, submit to technological drivers, pretend that we cannot change them, and just hope that they will make the world a better place? Investors, governments, and many organizations are panting for the former, for driving change that puts the UK industry at the forefront of responsible innovation. Companies are seeking new ways to align their innovations with social values, like Digital Catapult, the Turing Institute, and the Lovelace Institute are some of the organizations driving this change. 
as we create technologies that promise to improve people's lives, their health and well-being, engineers need to make similar ethical commitments to those health professionals have with their patients. These include supporting well-being, making sure they do not harm, supporting human autonomy, be fair and just. Imagine what happens when doctors, hospitals or others involved with your health are motivated only by profit. When you don't have an NHS, you need to be very careful about the way that business models affect the health of nations. That is why we now have a biomedical ethics framework that all in the industry must abide to. That is why we also have strong regulatory frameworks that limit how products are designed, manufactured and commercialized. Now we need similar ethical frameworks for technology. In my lab, we have been developing theoretical models that better help us better understand how technologies can support well-being. How, for example, a health technology can be more engaging. How it can allow users to easily personalize the interface or feel autonomous by setting their own goals or they that it provides means to build meaningful relationships with others. We have also been building the empirical evidence of what works and what doesn't. For example, our Headgear app was developed to help employees in male-dominated workplaces. Through a very large randomized control trial, the best way to assess the impact, we were able to show its efficacy in preventing depression and anxiety in workplaces. This has the obvious benefit to employees, right? But also to employers because mental health is one of the biggest causes of illness and absenteeism. So where do I see our relationship with technology in 2040? Well, I also back the horses of responsible innovation. I'm an optimist. In 2040, technologies will support our well-being. They will be tested to make sure they cause no harm. And so they support our sense of autonomy, not controlling us towards someone else's intended behaviors. Technologies will be making the world a fairer place. So how is the world going to be different when this happens? Well, technology that aligns with social values and that acknowledges the impact it has on society will take us to the places we, as a society, want to go. If you're an engineer, a designer or entrepreneur, take the lead. Show your employees and your customers how you're ahead of the game, how you're willing to hear and adapt to the new ethics that puts them and society above all else. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. It was a very insightful talk. Um, and it was interesting to hear how you proposed to include uh, well-being focus rather than just uh, some of the more functional sides of uh, ethics and privacy, something that sometimes is deprioritized. So I have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience ahead of this event, and I think I'll, I'll start with one of them. So the first one is, is there a risk that technology change is quicker than policy and regulation, meaning that we won't be able to address new technological issues before it's too late? And what can we do to stay ahead and rigorously assess these technologies to mitigate against unintended consequences? Yes, thank you. I, I do think that that's a big risk. It's mm. a big risk that all governments around the world are dealing with. Um, on the positive side, we do have experiences, for example, with the pharmaceutical industry who, that is very innovative. You know, the pharmaceutical industry has evolved over the last 50, 100 years and follows a very, very strict protocols. Um, so, of course, we are not used to doing that in, in technologies, uh, but maybe we do require kind of a mindset change 
Uh, we need to be looking more broadly uh, at these problems. Um, and we have to acknowledge also that certain disciplines like sociology have been looking at, at these uh, type of issues for some time. And policymakers, the UK is at the forefront of looking at, at the impact of technology on society. Uh, and these two groups, so sociologists, policymakers, uh, are already doing a lot of work. And the issues we have is how to bring these back to engineering practice. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Uh, I, I do think that w we can create regulations that don't limit innovation, where companies can still go and create new products, but then there is a new, uh, th there's an oversight. Um, we could, for example, be looking at uh, procurement processes. That's a very common approach that the Canadian government is using. Mm -hmm. So there is a question that has come in now um, that asks, since engineers, designers, innovators are often too close in their professional pressure and bubbles, how can we get ethical engineering practices into these professionals' attention without relying on proactiveness and the shift in priorities for its employers to quickly turn words into action? And then he said, obrigado as well, <laughs> which is uh, quite lovely. Uh, uh, uh question uh, and is one that I ask myself very often. Uh, I think there's um, uh, very now in the set of we compass uh, other disciplines have uh, new perspectives that are around, uh, brought the picture of impact that we have on society. Uh, design engineering, it's a discipline that has that exact perspective. So before coming to Imperial, uh, I was a professor in software engineering, but I find now that design engineering is a perfect framework where students learn to look at all these different perspectives from understanding uh, psychological impact on users to the design processes uh, that designers uh, can use to actual engineering, including data science uh, and so on. And then we had another question coming in said, technology goes across cultures. So how can innovators adapt to differences between nations and cultures all over the world? So different companies are doing this in different ways. Amazon, for example, uh, sells in every country and they look at certain aspects that are common to mm -hmm. uh, worldwide. And there are certain aspects that are customized to the specific culture of the country. So you might have that in Japan, the logistics system is very different to the one that is used in the UK or the US. And that's because the, the way that people in Japan are used to uh, receiving packages or um, dealing with uh, the, um, customs and the post office and so on. So there are many different adjustments that companies have to do with the functional aspects of each culture. Of mm. course, there's also significant differences in the non-functional aspects of each culture that will have to do with uh, the way we relate to governments or the, the expectations that we might have about privacy. In some countries, those um, expectations change. Um, but companies are doing it already, and especially the successful companies are doing it very well. That doesn't mean that they take into account necessarily the, the values, but they do take into account the, the functional aspect. So do you then propose that there is a overall ethics model and then there are the kind of cultural nuances be, below that as well? Or how would that work? Yes. So once you have certain um, basic ideas that are, I believe, common to in human rights are can be understood worldwide. You can use them sign that I said to each particular culture. So for example, evidence shows that uh, people seek a sense of autonomy, of being in control of their own lives all around the world. Doesn't matter if it's Asia if, uh, or the West 
or if it's uh, a young person or an old person, doesn't matter the race, they want to feel that they're in control of their behavior. That's mm -hmm. what it's called autonomy in psychology. So uh, platforms that support the sense of autonomy will be respecting the values of anyone in, it, in any country. Pa platforms that control people have the opposite effect. So uh, in that way, I think that a universal perspective about what of, of human nature, I mm -hmm. think it's very useful. Of course, there are th certain things that are relative to each culture, uh, but um, because of, for the sake of relativism, we shouldn't um, throw, um, you know, everything else. Yeah. So I think we, we've got one quiet, um, interesting question that has come through from Stephen Cassidy at BT Research, who asks, how do we quantify well-being or societal impact in this new model? And the historical environmental impacts from industry are much more easily quantifiable. How can we give the new model equal weight? There is actually a lot of research in the space of well-being. So economies around the world, in the UK, in Europe, uh, have been measuring well-being and applying that to policy making for some time. The UK was at the forefront of this uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so different disciplines measure well-being in different ways, but they are all relatively well correlated. So economists use uh, what is called subjective well-being measures. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have big cohorts, samples of people, and they can go and ask um, what are they at, uh, about their quality of life, how they're doing, how they expect to be doing in the next few months. Um, and actually those variables are excellent for predicting the impact of different interventions. Uh, I remember reading an article a few years ago where Brexit could be or the intentions to vote for Brexit were more predicted, better predicted by well-being measures than by things related to employment and so on. So they were, they had really uh, interesting uh, variables um, that can be predicted with these measures. Fantastic. And are you working on a quantifiable model at the moment? <laughs> So as a design engineer, I always work with experts in a specific um, disciplines like mental health. So when you're working with a mental health professional, the measures are things like PHQ-9, that is a measure of depression and anxiety that is quite standard. Again, uh, these measures are so reliable that if you go to the doctor and you're diagnosed with depression or anxiety based in one of these measures, you are going to get treatment your insurance is going to pay. Insurance companies don't like to pay unless they are very convinced uh, that that measure is reliable. And according to the clinical model, not being ill is the mm. same as being well. Of course, other measures like the ones economists use are very different, but economists use those measures to understand better the impact of their policies. And instead of using GDP, how much money we make, they're trying to move into measures that have to do with what the impact of that policy is on our well-being rather than on our wallets. So this can go beyond changing the technology, the product, actually changing how we look at economy today. Totally. I, I believe technologies mediate all our experiences. Mm. Using Zoom here changes our perception about how we relate to people. Now, in the last three months, we have learned that we can build connections with other people through Zoom. Obviously, there are pros and cons, mm. but we can still maintain certain uh, connections to our workplaces that before maybe we didn't expect to. We can do th that through this sort of platform. I can be talking to over 100 people right now and maybe spread all over the world. And it's thanks to that technology. But this technology mediates people's experiences and that means they might be seeing me in a particular way because the screen is not working well, or they might be uh, interpreting the medium uh, rather than the message. Sometimes philosophers say that two things come together, but um, I think the medium presents uh, the way we see the world. Fantastic. 
So let's take one more uh, question from the audience who said, uh, Kenny said, do we see regulators overseeing ethics? If so, would it be a central body or would it be embedded in existing set of regulators? Interested in your perspective. I, I do think that we, we should try to reuse the systems that already exist. Mm -hmm. um, the UK has uh, organizations like Ofcom and now has other ones that has been created around data ethics. Uh, um, and those institutions could inform the way regulation is done. Uh, I'm not an expert on policy making, so I, uh, I wouldn't say which is the right organization in the UK. And mm -hmm. I'm confident that that would be very different in other countries. Uh, but in exactly 50 years ago, the, the US created the Environmental Protection Agency. And that regulation then influenced uh, countries all over the world on how they regulated um, their own sustainability impact assessments. Um, I think uh, we are in a good position, uh, the UK today, to, to start taking that role. Uh, definitely Europe is trying to do that, to try to find ways in which they could uh, regulate the system and that sometimes is not necessarily regulated by give indications or guidance or set up procurement processes that uh, make the industry go in, in one particular direction. So it's sometimes about creating the right drivers, motivational drivers for companies and designers to start focusing on new perspectives that maybe before they did not think about. Um, so I'm not sure which is the right organization to do that in the UK. That will change uh, in different countries. It might be a new one or it might be one that already exists. Ofcom does a fantastic work, for example, on tracking the impact of technology on youth and people of different ages. Maybe um, an extension of Ofcom would be the right one. Fantastic. And I think we'll do one last question before we end the Q&A. So this is more an actionable question. So if I as an organization would want to start using the Hyatt approach, would this mean starting technology ethics department similar to what's happened in sustainability? How would it look like and what type of talent would, would we need to have inside organizations? So it depends on the size of your organization. Uh, large organizations are already doing that. They have their own uh, ethics person or group. Sometimes they hire external consultants. Uh, startups uh, can benefit from organizations like the um, um, Digital Catapult. In, in the UK, Digital Catapult offers uh, services to startups uh, and they look and they, one of the services they offer is a machine learning ethics committee of which I'm part of, I should um, mention. Uh, and these companies can get advice for free on what are the, the most responsible approaches to designing the technologies, the AI, AI algorithms and data collection mechanisms, what to do with the data, and what not to do, uh, and so forth. So there are systems already in place for organizations who cannot pay or don't have the scale to have their own systems. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rafa.